You are now listening to Sweep the Rack Podcast featuring Brooklyn Rob and Big Mike. Rob, what's good, homie? Did we did we just have some technical difficulties with our uh, with our intro song there? I don't know because I heard it on my end, so I was okay. that's the first All time right. I've actually little, heard it. It was a little choppy on my end, so I don't know. I apologize to the people if we had some technical stuff there. And they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, Rob, we're they'll live. Be having a song. We're live. It's Sunday night. Uh, we're, we're, this is not our usual night to go live. We're doing something a little bit different tonight. Well, it's not different for what we used to do. It's different for, uh, our new format here since we switched to the video format. Um, you know, we used to do a lot of longer, uh, one-on-one interviews when we were just doing the audio format. And since we came over to the video format, you know, we've done some of that, no question, but, uh, you know, we've gotten away from that a little bit, especially over the last month or so. Um, but, you know, Rob, sweet the rack. We love our Hall of Famers. We love our legends around here. And uh, we got a legend among legends tonight, no? Yeah, well, here's the thing is, like, Kelly's name has came up in a bunch of previous podcasts um, in the last, uh, you know, couple months. Um, and we I brought her up a, a bunch of times. But here's the thing, Mike. My mom will not leave me alone until I get Kelly on the show. Like, no, I'm not even kidding. Every time I, I tell her, Mom, I, I had Walter Ray on, or Mama, we had Norm Duke on, my mom says, where's Kelly? Why aren't you bringing Kelly on? And I say, Mom, like, I- I'm going to reach out. Like, you know, she's, you know, I don't know if she's going to come on. So uh, anyway, so thankfully, we all have to please our moms. And now that I'm staying with Mom, right, um, I have to, like, make her uh, wishes come true. And, uh, and Kelly's name has come up. And look, I've had some really opinionated, uh, some like points where I've talked about Kelly and I've just said, you know, Hey, we got to get her on. I want to talk to her. I want to see what's going on with her, what she's up to. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And do a nice, uh, in-depth interview with her, talk to her about her, her previous accomplishments. I mean, her resume, Mike is crazy. Like I wish I would have one of these. If she, maybe she could like UPS me a silver medal, uh, just one silver medal. Like I'd be happy. I could, wear it around like my uh, my house or something but yeah well, I'm I mean, excited Rob, to talk you, to you. you alluded to it there and, and you've said it before that you know and we'll talk about this obviously in the interview but you know you've said it before that uh had the P- pwba not shut down you feel like she would she would be the best female bowler ever and there'd be no question she, about that i mean she's in the conversation anyway right yeah. but but you feel like it would be a lock stock and barrel type situation had that not happened it would, it would be her and Liz just beating each other up for years. And it would be such a great rivalry and fun thing to watch. So um, I say let's bring her on and let's – I mean, unless you got something else to say, I'm, I'm kind of ready to talk to her. Well, yeah, I just want to let the people know, you know, obviously there was live PBA bowling today, right? And uh, if you were – yeah, all right, all right. If you were following us on Twitter, <laughs> you got a little bit of our uh, of our banter back and forth. But I don't want to disappoint people, but we're not getting into that tonight. Uh, if you want to hear our thoughts on the show on from today and yesterday, uh, check us out on Wednesday, right, Rob? And uh, I might be going on uh, the Beef and Barnsey show on Tuesday, perhaps. So you could maybe check me out there. But uh, tonight, it's just for our interview. Uh, it's just just to just to have a chat with Kelly here, and uh, maybe a minute or two at the end, Rob. Maybe a minute or two on some thoughts, just to just to yeah. set it up with the people, but. Let's uh, let's not get into it. Let's save it for later, and uh, let's bring on one of the greatest female bowlers of all time, Rob uh, Kelly Kula. Kelly, welcome to Sweep the Rack for the first time. What's up, guys? Pleasure to be here. Kelly, you don't want to you you don't want to get into some banter with us about the show, the the, the live show of uh, this Saturday and Sunday. I got into a kind of a Twitter rant about how I was bored and just kind of just not into it so uh i don't know we'll kind of save that i think discussion for wednesday you should join us on our live our live show wednesday kelly i'll, I'll tune in just to see what the bantering's all about oh we have Absolutely. some good ones yeah we have some good ones yeah tune uh, in and watch me watch me crush rob's perspective from <laughs> from uh in a, in a much impressive way uh, i definitely suggest it so uh kelly like i said welcome sweep the rack first time uh, we've wanted to have you on for a while. I mean, Rob, we tell people when they come on that, 
you know, we had a list of, of guests that we wanted when we, before we even started this podcast. And, uh, you were absolutely 100% on that list. One of the few female bowlers on that list. So, uh, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. And, uh, I guess where we want to start is, uh, is with your, we, you know, we start in the same place with a lot of people, you know, tell us about your upbringing in bowling and how you got into the game of bowling. I know Rob, you, you would like to hear specifically about, uh, some of her exploits in, in Jersey where I'm at over on the East coast. So, you know, if you want to get into that, you can, but give the people an idea of how, how the game came into your life. Yeah, gentlemen, it's pretty simple. My sisters are eight and seven years older than I am. So when they would go shopping with grandma, if our grandparents were watching us, I would go bowling with my grandfather. And then my neighbor down the street, one of my best friends growing up, Michael Henninger, his father's brother was the manager of the local center. And it just turned into a fun activity on a Saturday afternoon that all of a sudden said, hey, if you want to join a youth league, you can come back every Saturday and do this. And, and basically that's how it started. That's how it continued on until I graduated high school. So every Saturday, and as a kid, I got to admit, as a youngster, I went for the bowling, I went for the atmosphere, and, and I went for the grilled cheese, Pepsi, and French fries, too. Got to be food. Yeah, I mean, Rob, how, how familiar does that sound, right? <laughs> I mean, we're, yeah. all, we're all around the same age, and, and we bowled in college at the same times, all three of us. And uh, how familiar does that sound? That's what I thought when you were answering that question. Like, I started in bowling the same way. It started out as a fun thing, Saturday morning leagues, met some people, had a knack for it, and that's how I got involved in it. Rob, I know you bowled Saturday morning leagues, you know, and that was a huge part of your your upbringing in the game of bowling. Uh, does that does that still exist today? Do you guys think, like, is it as strong today as it was when, when we were coming up? Um, you know, from my perspective, not really. Um, the entry level for the youth bowling, just because I, I feel – that in today's, you know, current, not even just a pandemic, but the 2020, the, the 21st century um, with the Tiger Woods and Serena Williams, more parents are really focusing on one sport only. And they're not mm. putting their kids or sons or daughters into multiple activities. So they tend to be focused in one area. It could be tennis, could be golf, football, and so forth. So I, I have seen a decline in terms of, of youth bowlers. However, you know, you get to that junior gold area that USBC runs every year and it just can, can immensely keeps getting larger and larger. So we may not see the dedication on the Saturday every week league, the 32 week season, but we are seeing the commitment and the dedication to bowling year round in JBTs and YBCs and any youth tournaments. Kids are traveling 200 miles just to bowl league. So they're doing it. They're just doing it at a different level. Rob, thoughts there? I mean, man, I feel bad for kids that don't have that Saturday morning bowling experience. Uh, it's such a major part of my upbringing. And I know my two brothers, their upbringing, you know, bowl in the morning or we bowl Friday night teens and then we wake up on Saturday morning and then we would get some pizza. We'd go home and then we'd go out for Saturday night family bowling. I mean, it's amazing how much bowling we did out over the weekends. And as a kid, that was probably my favorite part of my upbringing. So yeah, for me, uh, it was it was often like Saturday morning league, and then the quick ride home to go catch bowling on Saturday afternoon yeah. and watch it. You know, that was kind of like my standard Saturday for many for many years coming up. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned that a friend of yours, their their father was the manager at the at the local center. What center was that in New Jersey? Yeah, I, I started my junior bowling at Linden Lanes, New Jersey, Linden in Lanes. Linden. Okay. So 24 little nationwide center, had wood lanes at first. By the time I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15, converted to uh, to synthetic lanes. So just a great center, great junior coach. Uh, Joe Hegedus, his wife, Emile, and their son, Joey, also bowled as well. And, you know, the, 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 the bones behind youth bowling is always that volunteer or volunteers of a family and, and family members themselves really engaging the youngsters in bowling and having fun and then also going on to those county and state events and then the inter the national events as well. So, you know, come on, you mentioned the good people and that's, that's excellent, but we all know that there's some characters in New Jersey bowling alley, you know, in that whole area. So how much exposure did you get to that side of, of the game? You know, that's part of the reason Rob and I started this podcast was to bring out some of those characters and those stories you don't you don't have to name names obviously but how much were you exposed to the action side and the I guess the more the the, the more uh, rough side of bowling in New Jersey um well I, I bowled so I got to I got to bowl in Garden State Lanes I bowled a, uh -oh. a Sunday night trios league 
And then uh -huh. we'd also go there for, for some tournaments along the way. So in New Jersey and New York, you can find a hustle anywhere, especially in a bowling center. So I remember one time I was bowling junior league and these group of guys were sitting behind us and I, I had like seven in a row and they start pulling out money and start betting. She's going to, I got 20 bucks and she's getting the front 10, 20, 10. They would bet on anything. So, uh, yeah. And then when the pros would come to town, there was always a little connection between Long Island and Staten Island. And then of course in the city itself where, where guys would, would meet up to, to, uh, to throw the ball around per se for, for some score and maybe for some treats. So, yeah. Yeah. Garden State Bowl. Can we talk about Garden State for a second? Oh my yeah. God. So I went to college in Jersey City. I was from Philly, but I went to school in Jersey City. And that's kind of where my introduction to the New Jersey bowling scene really became clear. And uh, I got the, the pleasure of bowling at Garden State, which is now closed down. Uh, there's actually a UBA team named after the bowling alley. That's how that's how infamous this this uh, bowling center was. But I got a chance to go and bowl there a couple times. And Rob, let me tell you something. You could walk into this bowling center on a Sunday morning and you could get any – you could buy anything you want. Anything you want. I mean, name it, and you could get your hands. I'm talking DVDs, CDs, <laughs> toiletries, tires, illegal <laughs> things. Illegal things for sure, a little bit, okay? But listen, I mean, what a place. What a place. Like legendary place. That you used to drive on the parkway of New Jersey, and you would just see the big – bowling pin with the bowling yeah. ball and that was garden state and uh yeah what a what a legendary place man so you know obviously coming up in jersey we got to ask you about those kinds of things so uh from jersey rob says that you got your background somewhat through the dick ricker bowling camps i have my dick ricker plaque right above me over here it's right there yeah, we all got pictures with dick ricker oh, I, yeah. so every year it's like i'm like this tall and then the next year i'm that tall right everybody yeah. has that yeah. um so I guess my question on that is to follow yeah, up to my I'm not lying. lying. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> how much of your style today and I, I, that you're bowling is, is, is like attributed to Dick Ricker bowling camp? Because I know that was a big part of your like junior uh, and amateur, I'd say coaching and going to camp, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, since you guys got to experience too, to me, the physical game is constantly changing. You know, there's modifications made, there's transformations between over the bar with the push away to the hinge, to the lead and everything. So the game physically is always going to change because of the, the, the bowling balls, the oil and so forth. But really the rigor system and a lot of people don't know the number system still works. It's not necessarily the breakdown and the moves that the Ricker system taught, but really it gives you that foundation starting place of where you need to play the lane if you want to hit third arrow, fourth arrow, up, up or two, and so forth. So some of the tools of the trade and some of the adaptations I made throughout my game really came from that program. And, it, and it, like I said, I don't know how some people, like I've asked coaches, I've asked athletes, I said, well, how do you know where to stand if you want to hit 12 or if you want to have a three board angle to it? It's like, well, I just start over here. Well, well, why? Does that always work? Does it not work? So really, the, the science and knowledge of the Ricker program is, is definitely a great base and foundation to get yourself started if you want to play an extreme part of the lane. And now the conditions are so demanding, you need to have a good starting point. Um, itself, you know, 369 can still be used in some leagues and everything, but the, the, the things you learned, obviously, we progress so much with the game and the, and the better coaching along the way. But, you know, sometimes that wrist position that Dick taught me comes into play. You know, decelerating, which we normally don't do in bowling. We tend to speed up the ball itself. But Dick had a great method for decelerating the ball. And then why, when you're playing the gutter, should you look close down? Because you don't want to overextend the follow through and miss inside your target. So a lot of great teaching tools from that. And you guys know Dick himself was a great master of the mental game. He could stay so cool and so calm and relaxed in any pressure situation. I think maybe that's one thing I might've lacked from that program and not picking it up fast enough. I'd had to learn along the way, but I would probably say at least 80%, 80 to 90%, especially when it comes to the beginners and the skill level, nobody in the United States or in the world has some of the skill drills that his program had, had invented and implemented throughout those weeks of camp. So 80 to Mike. 90%. There was two things I remember from the Dick Ricker camp, and I know Kelly's going to laugh when I uh, – one was Ides Lanes, right, in Ithaca, New York. I mean, it was like vintage. I think it's still there, actually. Ray now that it's, Ray gun. it's not. No, it's, it's gone. Now. Oh, oh, that's yeah. sad. Uh, that's just sad. 
um, Pressure 300, right? Yeah. He used to literally shut the whole place down and he had this microphone and he'd be like, Rob on lane two, stepping up for his first shot of his 300 and everybody would be watching you. And yeah. you were so nervous because you're trying to learn all these physical tools, but then you're trying to like do this 300 in front of everybody. Yeah. Um, and he was the first person to ever show anybody how to play the one, two board. Yep. Like that's a whole other man. I, I, and they're still, he's still doing the Dick Ricker camp. He's still doing, he's got that all right. I'm pretty sure that's still going on. Right. Yeah. Tony Bolello still runs it. Uh, I'm still oh. a part of it. I haven't been able to teach the last five years because of the ladies tour, but I'm still, I'm still affiliated in some sense. And then Bob Ray, of course, on the West coast, he keeps saying he's going to retire, but you know, the umbilical cord hasn't detached yet. So just a, another great mentor. He was Dick's right hand uh, alongside after Eddie had passed on. So, so there, it's still going on. They're still teaching it mainly on the East coast and a couple satellite programs out West and in the Midwest. Yeah, I got to fess up. Like, I was probably the worst Dick Ricker student in the history of Dick Ricker <laughs> camps. I was like a total jerk. Uh, I thought I threw it great. Nobody could tell me shit. Um, I thought some of the some of the drills that they did were, were cool. Like, I liked the mirror on the lane because I got to see myself throw it. And uh, they had so, so, he's so absorbed. <laughs> And you would, Mike, like to see yourself throw the ball. I just can't even with that. And they had a they had a machine that like helped you free up your arm swing, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, I, I gotta fess up. Like, you know, at the end of the week they would do like the video montage of everyone where they would show the shot that you threw when you came in and the shot that you threw when you left. Everybody that was at the camp with me, it was like remarkable difference between one shot and another. My shit was exactly the same. It was the exact same, same shot. So like yeah, I, I, you know, great experience. Loved it. Awesome to be able to go up there for that many days and bowl and hang out. But uh, I probably should have listened a little bit more. But that's that's why I'm uh, that's why I'm a teacher, and not a professional bowler, I guess at this point. So I should have should have listened to more people than just Dick Ricker too. I was like that with everybody. But all right, Kelly, you, we talked a little bit before we came on the air. Uh, Rob, let's talk about her resume because it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like four pages on my on my Word uh, document here when I copied and pasted it. Uh, and uh, I mean, so many gold medals and silver medals and international tournaments and, of course, PWBA. And so my question here is, out of all the accomplishments that you've had in your career, which one or two stick out the most and uh, maybe um, – kind of why those are the, the accomplishments. And I know you're probably going to say the, the one show I'm, I'm a, but I could be wrong here, right? Like you could have other accomplishments that you're actually more proud of than that TOC. But yeah, what do you think, Kelly? Uh, I know I just, I'm just, no, that's right. awesome. You know, I got to be consistent though, but the TSC, I, I dreamed as a, as a young girl that I would one day win a men's title. You know, when the ladies tour folded, I know you guys might touch upon that. I was I was with Jim Tomek at the time. We dated for four and a half years, and, and, and he bowled on tour, and then the PBA opened his door to women. So when I was able to bowl, and I bowled the regionals, and I had success. I, I won two, but, you know, I, I really learned a lot by bowling against the East Coast gentlemen, and then gave me the experience to go out nationally. And then the TSC was just that dream that, that came true. I, I, I always thought I'd win a title. I thought I was going to be against Pete. I really, or Walter Ray and, you know, it, but Chris Barnes was, was the icing on the cake too. So no complaints there, but that by far is the greatest moment. Um, team USA, you know, I've had some great memories, but uh, the last time we won the team event in Abu Dhabi, watching Liz shoot 300 and we won the team event and Danielle and I won golden doubles when we weren't favored to win against Korea on the short pattern. And, and I got to give due credit to Rod Ross because we just, emphasize bowling on, you know, something that we weren't strong at and that was on the short pattern. So some great memories, being able to travel the world with a bowling ball, it's heavy, of course, made for unusual and crazy luggage and expenses. But, uh, you know, because of it, I was able to see more of the world than I ever dreamed I would be able to, to venture out and, and explore. Why was Barnes the icing on the cake? 
<laughs> yeah, because he was at the top of his game. I mean, he went out. He was rookie of the year on the men's tour. He already won the TSC. He was looking for a second time winning it and so forth. The, the guy is uh, – I have so much respect for Chris because I think him and I have a lot in common. We're students of the game. We, we know everything from the inside of the bowling ball to the outside to drilling it to physical game and techniques. Um, but I, I just, unfortunately, I, I feel like I'm really good at, at finishing second a lot. And, you know, he was at the prime of his game and so well respected with his resume from Team USA, international, professional, all the contracts he'd been on and what he can do with the bowling ball and adapt so quickly. I, he was, he still is most, one of the most highly respected athletes in the game of bowling today. And, um, you know, being able to beat him and defeat him and, and what a classy, classy gentleman he was and how he handled it. You know, he got some flat gear for that for about a good year or so. And and, and Chris, by far, and, and Linda and the family, he was a true gentleman and just said, I got beat. And that's all it was. That's all it was. Did he, um, was he that classy back in the paddock after he lost when nobody was watching? And honestly, Rob, I, I was swifted away <laughs> from um, the lane guy going right back into the media room. I couldn't see anybody else's reaction except being in front of the camera and, and being interviewed. And then, you know, Ooh. all of a sudden my phone just had, you know, your, your voice box is full. Your messages are full. So I was trying to get through all that. So that let's talk about after you won, because that was kind of one of my questions. Um, sure. I mean, what a, that's unbelievable. Right. And you, you're, you just pretty much accomplished your dream, right. Of everything you've worked for your whole life, everything you've done. What did you do that night? Did you go out party? Because if that was me, Kelly, you know, I, oh my goodness, there would have been bottles. I would have, I, I would have all my boys with me. We would have been partying. You would have carried me out of there on a stretcher. What did you do that uh, night? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. And it's very simple. It's, you know, being the first woman, being overwhelmed, being in Red Rock Casino and so forth. Uh, again, do credit. Dennis, who was the manager of Red Rock Lanes, took myself and my mom out to the, the steak restaurant right there in Red Rock Casino. We had a wonderful, fabulous dinner. We had some great conversation with Dennis himself. We talked about bowling. We talked about the achievement. We talked about how the historic uh, championship occurred in his building under his management and everything. And I just, I had a great night with my mother. We had to get on a plane the next day. And um, sadly she was in pain. She had a torn ligament in her ankle. So we, I just tried to make her comfortable, but the whole highlight of that week and that moment itself was being able to share it with her. So I, I spent it with my best friend and my mother and just relishing in, in that victory that night. And then, and then after you went home, did you party then? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Yeah, I went home. I went. I went line dancing. I went and saw some friends. I just. I went to the body shop, and again, I, I was inundated by phone calls and interviews and TV shows coming up to my to, to Jersey Lanes, which I would go practice to when I was in college, to just trying to fill all those obligations because you have to strike while the iron's hot, right? Isn't that the expression and everything? And the only way you can sell bowling and yourself is, is by fulfilling all those obligations. So I basically, excuse the expression, but I pimped myself out to anybody with a camera and anybody with a pen and ledger that was willing to write a story about me and, and being the first female to break that glass. So a great exposure. Good morning, America. I watch it today because of the people I met there. And, um, you know, for a lot of lot of exposure also to Jersey Lanes, John and Chuck Battigay over there. So it, it was it was it was great to have that type of um, attention for bowling and myself. That was so epic, yo. Dude. It was. Um, I mean, I can't wait to that, see that 10 frame. I'm waiting for it. Like, the I remember I remember watching it. I remember very vividly watching that show. And Kelly, I mean. Rob and I were fans of we bowl, but we're fans of bowling. That's why we do this podcast. And uh, I remember watching that, and it was just amazing. I mean, I, I got the feeling that you were going to do it, uh, you know, going into that championship match. And let's be honest, you know, and I've said this before on the show, Barnes had a lot of struggles during that time, you know, mentally on TV, especially as the top seed. And you just got the feeling going in that it was it was your time. And it was not his time, and you just got a sense of what was going to happen there. And to see you pull it off was just, you know, it was amazing. It was epic. But honestly, to those that knew you and saw you come up and had watched your career, I, I really don't think it was that surprising. You know, if you had, right, if you had to pick a, a, a female bowler that was going to win on the, on the men's tour, you know, no disrespect to Liz Johnson, but just in terms of their game, 
right? You would pick Kelly Kulik. I mean, at, 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 in in the recent history of bowling, anyway, Rob. And uh, you know, like oh. he, like Rob said, your resume is, speaks for itself. So you already had a lot of accomplishments before that. You know, it wasn't like you came out of the blue and won the men's TOC. You know, you were already oh. one of the best female bowlers on the planet. But go ahead, Rob. Mike, so I talked about her accomplishments, right, and how, like, they're, like, pages long. I could go through some of these. Yeah, we got to talk a little college bowling, though. You, talk you, college. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I do want to talk college bowling, but I kind of feel like there's a good transition in, um, into the PWBA because you brought it up and, and it folded in 2003, and I kind of want to go there and talk to a little bit about that. Um I've been on record saying that I feel like that you're – that you suffered or, or – that folding actually probably hurt you the most because you were coming into your own. You were, you know, it, it was a really good time for you. Like you, you were in your prime um, and your accomplishments would probably be two to three pages, pages longer if that never folded. Um, so I guess what was going on at that time when it folded, how you kind of like dealt with it, like what was going on through your mind? Like I kind of want to get into that period because that couldn't have been a good time for you as a bowler. Yeah, no, Rob, you're right. It was it was one of the worst times in, in my career. I went back working for my dad, uh, which I'd done part time when, when the tour was was off and everything. And I was really, you know, I, I say this every time, but my mom was she thought for sure I'd be back. And, and whether that was going to be six months to a year, maybe even two years, she really thought it was going to be even faster than, unfortunately, the 13 year time frame that it took to get back. So there were a lot of great bowlers. Tennille Milligan, you know, she was just getting in her prime. She had won the U.S. Open. She had some great victories. And Cara Honeychurch, had she stayed over in the United States, might still have been dominating. Carolyn had some great years. Um, we just we weren't growing our tour. And just, and it was like now we're, we're losing sponsors. We don't have some big sponsors behind it. So I would like to say that when the tour regenerated, I was going to come out and just win, you know, half the events year, right out from the beginning. But I just feel like I've had some bad timing and I don't want it to sound like an excuse, but the women's tour folded. I went out with Jimmy. We, we bowled on the men's tour together. I had some success there. The tour came back. I was a spokesperson. Then I, I fell into this commentating thing I was asked to do and, and really feel like I, I've enjoyed doing that as well and putting the women in front of the camera in that spotlight and emphasizing what they do well because of my background and my coaching ability and the Ricker program themselves. So you know, I, I still have yet to be player of the year. It's one of the ultimate goals that I have yet to achieve. And it does bother me a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think I should have 20 titles by now, but it comes down to accountability. And Ryan Schaefer said this about me a long time ago. You know, you're a jack of all trades, Kelly, but not a master of one. And and Liz Johnson, what she can do, her, her what makes Liz so great, and I've said this to her before and to the, and to the audience, is the simplicity of her game. She's a more down and in player. Her angles are always very much in front of her. She can get and play 20. I've seen her do it multiple times. She controls the pocket. And with my rev rate and ball speed, I do get in a little trouble because I get forced deeper faster and I have to use more of the lane to get more skid through the front. So, um, you know, there's things I've learned. And then when I learn them, it's like I have to leapfrog back to what I did well because I, I need to focus on that. So um, just bad timing on my part. But I may not have as many victories or titles on my resume that I would like. You know, I know I've got a lot of seconds, a lot of TV shows, and that has to account for something. But I just feel like I'm respected so much by my fellow athletes and competitors amongst the coaching community out there. And, you know, people have a question. They want, they, they come to me and they ask me the question because they know I'm going to give an honest answer. So, yeah, I wish I had 25 titles or close to 30 by now. But just because uh, there's only 12 events a year doesn't mean that Kelly Kulik's not going to have a year like Shannon O'Keefe for Liz Johnson. So I, I don't – we may get to this later on a telecast. I'm, I'm kind of falling out of love with bowling right now. But – I have a feeling just like every athlete, they, they take that hiatus, they take that break, they come back and they and they still do well. So don't count me out yet. I think there's more titles to come, but it, it would have been nice had the had the tour not folded that I, I think I definitely would have had at least two or three more pages, Rob, as your for your biography there. Oh, there's no question in my mind. Uh and you know, it's one of those things where like you have no control over it, right? So and it's it was bad timing. You know, um, but I mean, someone on our chat, I think it was uh, JD actually said you might have not had the TOC title if the PWBA never folded. Exactly. So yep. it's a good point, right? Like, Where, yeah, I mean, they, is the men's major, is it worth, is it better than 20 PWBA titles? That's some people might say, I'd rather take the men's major. 
Me, if I won a meds major, I would never bowl ever again. I, w- I would just retire and I would do this podcast for the rest of my life. Um, it, it opened the door for so many others. You know, I think women realize that they can compete with men at a certain level. Um, you know, it gave me that that urge for winning. I wish I did again. And again, I wish I had more success on the men's tour. There's a, there's a lot of wishing going on. I need a lot of pennies, heads up to throw into a wishing wheel. But I, it's, you know, I, I watched I watched a movie recently and, and um, we may not like who our teachers are or, or who are, you know, our, our siblings or parent, what, you know, some family, whatever along the way, but we turn out the way we are based on how we mold ourselves from the experiences that we're in. And, um, you know, like you said, Rob had the tour not fold it. One of the, the guests said, I may not have had that TSC title. It might've been what Liz did and won the chameleon. So no regrets, just only learning, looking forward. And what else can I do moving on? What, uh, what movie? Uh, believe it or not, it was um, oh, beautiful day in the neighborhood. The Tom Hanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the, and the, Mr. Uh, Rogers, the Mr. Rogers. Yeah, he he's there, and he just says, you know, in the movie, he doesn't get along with his father. He has a lot of hatred towards his father because his mother was dying of cancer, and his father left out. And um, the way his father maybe have treated him or mistreated him kind of molded him into the person and the father that he was going to be for his family. So, you know, the experiences we learn. You know, looking back at that moment may not have been what we'd like to have heard or, or have had to experience, but moving forward, it, it might have shaped me into that commentator, that better person, that coach along the way, and inspired some of these other bowlers to, to pursue their dream and, and bring back the ladies tour where it is now since it started in 2015. So, yeah, it's it, the glass is half full. Is it half empty? Or as the theorists would say, I want to know what's in it. So, Mike, I need to hire Kelly as my like mental training coach uh, for this podcast. Your, your life perspective coach. Yeah, I need. You know, hey, you know, I'm. I call her every morning during the week to get ins- inspiration to do my Excel spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> you need, you need, you need Kelly Kulik. I need Tim Mack. I've said that on the on the show before, <laughs> so maybe we could maybe we could both get that done in some way. Uh, sure. Rob. Part of Kelly's outstanding resume, as I said before, has a lot to do with college bowling. Uh, Kelly, you bowled at Moorhead State University. Yep. You, know, you kind of, I mean, I would say like built the Invented. name behind that program, oh, right? Abs- like, absolutely. You know, they were not, they, sure. like, I never heard of Moorhead State University until I saw you bowl for them. And then I knew them for, you know, from then on, it was like, oh, they're a decent, you know, team, decent program. Tell us about your college bowling. How'd you end up at Moorhead? So you guys remember the East Coast College Tournament, that showboat lanes in Atlantic City, right? You know, yeah. the huge center one, the biggest back then after the other ones had closed down. So I, I met Larry on a whim. Ellen Eichenlob, who was a year older than I was, had had met up with him. And, and she we bowled against each other occasionally in the state tournament. She introduced him. And, and Larry is just as laid back of a man as you can meet. I mean, he wasn't – didn't try to overpressure me by saying, we've got this program, we've got that program, we've got this. He basically said – you know, I can get you a little scholarship. I can get you some, you know, academic grant money along the way. We got this program and, and laid it out. And it just, he, he was, he was like another father that, that I was just looking for another father figure, another coach. Um, and Larry, I have to, and he would say too, Larry's a really good coach when it comes to that mental game of just inspiring and pushing and motivating and the never give up method. And Larry was a great spare shooter. So he, he promoted every time the low ball, the practicing shooting those single pin spares. In terms of physical game, I mean, he didn't know as he knew what he knew when he was bowling, and he could correct a couple of things, or he could just say, "Hey, be aggressive. You're getting a little slower." He just had those small cues. He really kept things simple, and and I I, I didn't care for Morehead at first. It was definitely a a change going from you know suburban New Jersey right outside New York to uh, going all the way to Moorhead, Kentucky, where, you know, going out to Walmart on the weekend was was fun or Cave Run Lake and a suitcase college. But the bowling team made it a great experience. I made some wonderful friendships out there. And I learned to appreciate that it's okay to slow down at times, that you don't have to keep going at a fast paced speed, that you can appreciate your surroundings and where you are. And I just fell in love with Moorhead. It was a, it was a great time for me. It really was. Uh, I know you want at least, one national championship there was it yep, more than one, one. yep uh okay. no but right. my fifth year i had one more i went to the nationals with team usa so i had to take an incomplete and I, larry allowed me to help see uh coach with the women's team that year when they won again so robin crawford won two 
and a couple other ladies, but uh, I, I just, the one was all I, I wanted and that was enough for me. That was a great experience. Now, right, so, for, correct me if I'm wrong, though. You threw that strike to win a national championship, right? My brother just commented, Mike, she, Kelly was just throwing it for the cheese. Like, it didn't, it, I mean. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I'll tell a story, okay? This is one of the craziest things I've ever seen in bowling, all right? So, uh, 19, must have been 1998 or 99. It was Buddy Tierno's uh, college tournament over the Christmas break. At Laurel Lanes, it was my freshman year, my first time bowling it, one of my first real big college tournaments. And uh, we go, Moorhead was there, Kelly was bowling at the time, and everybody knew who she was. So, you know, kind of watching her and whatnot. And there was, uh, you bowled the team event, and then at night after the, the first day, there was like the top 10 guys and the top 10 girls got put together as doubles teams. And then Buddy ran a, an additional doubles event that night that people would come and watch or whatever. Rob, we're talking late 90s, Wood Lanes, okay? Scorch. East Coast. Scorch. Scorch, Scorch of the Scorch. earth. Scorch. I mean, <laughs> 35 the shit I ever bowled on. I'm, I mean, crazy. That's what I remember about this. It was so crazy. I was like, I was just confused as hell. I really was like just like throwing the ball at the head pin from the left gutter. Rob, she went like 279, 300 for the two qualifying games. Shot 579. I mean, I couldn't crack an egg on this shit. And she shot 579, only missed once in two games. I'm telling you, at that time, it was the most impressive shit I had ever seen in person in bowling. I mean, I was blown away. I went back to the hotel because none of my teammates came to watch me. Thanks, guys. Everybody <laughs> just let me bowl myself. I went back to the hotel. I said, you guys are not going to believe what I just saw tonight. Like, what happened? I said, you know the shit we just got done bowling on? I'm like, the stuff that we were bowling on the last game. I'm like, we took an hour break. Okay, they were even drier than they were before. And some girl, this girl, Kelly Kulik from Moorhead State, came out and shot like 579 for two games and only missed once. They didn't believe me. I mean, crazy. So, listen, like, the, the, the making of a legend was already there, right? Like, you, you see these things. We've talked about it before, Rob. Like, all, all of the bowlers who reach the, this category, they all have various stories and points in their career where they accomplish these great things. Um, so, yeah, she, she, she was no different for sure. Um, Kelly, you, I'm going to compare you to Jason Belmonte, okay? Okay. And the reason I'm going to make that comparison is because uh, I feel like you and him are two bowlers who have managed to get a lot of exposure outside the game of bowling. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, I would definitely think that's fair to say. Um, for sure. Yeah. Jason, the, the fastest to 10 majors and what he's done in Australia. I mean, he's, he's an icon in his country and everything. And then just with, with my success, both in the men's regional and the tour and everything, you know, we, we brought a lot of exposure to, to the game itself. So absolutely. Yeah. And, and like, and I'm talking, I'm going outside of that too. And I'm going outside of bowling accomplishments. I'm talking more like the ESPN, the body issue. Okay. That you did a while back. Uh, Rob brought up and you brought up appearances on Good Morning America that you've made. I know that you've uh, you've done work where a comic book character was was crafted after your likeness. You know, on the side for Belmo, you know, you, you, he has got YouTube videos with Dude Perfect that have over a hundred million views. You yeah. know, so um, yeah, like I, in terms of that stuff, I guess what I want to ask is, what can other bowlers do or? To, to get that kind of exposure. I feel like we need more of that in the game of bowling. Yeah, we do, gentlemen. If I had the answer, I think the women would have a lot more sponsors and the men as well. Um, you know, this, the success we've had on the lanes is what's led to the outside stuff coming in. The, the comic book was really having a good rapport with, with the young lady in a pro-am and her father just took notice of that. I think a lot of things happen is not just because of your skill level and what you can do with the bowling ball itself, but who you are as a human being. And I'm, I'm always worried about the human factor. You know, it's more important for me who I am off the lanes than sometimes who I am on the lanes. You know, success doesn't determine what the human being is going to turn out to be. So uh, Jason is great with social media. He was a big part of that, that migration as it grew up. I am not a big fan of social media. I'm a more of a private person. I, I just... It's, it's a great platform, but he does a fantastic job 
of, of those videos and throwing bowling balls in a pool and going around a track at 180 miles an hour and letting the ball go. I mean, that's inventive. It's creative and so forth. So the, the comic book, like I said, was just meeting the girl and taking the time to talk to her and then meeting her father in Long Island and, and developing that friendship. It goes, I want to put you in a comic book. ESPN, the magazine, I think it was only the second year. They were really looking to um, exploit other sports. And again, heard of my accomplishments. I, I've met a lot of great media personnel, personalities along that route to get all those interviews done. And, and they just remembered me along the way. I was very fortunate that I, I got a nod in one of a Lifetime movies. Um, you know, that the girl for Halloween was Kelly Kulix. That was her favorite bowler. And the woman's favorite ball was a storm bowling ball. So you expose yourself not by, by your success, but also what you do um, outside of that bowling. And and it really could just be me teaching a class at the YMCA and, and just making a difference in that person's life and, and so forth and taking the time. I, I know I've missed a few autographs along the way, and I apologize. There's just some of those moments in, in time where you have a lot of accessibility. There's a close exposure between the fans themselves and the bowlers. I know I'm not going to please everybody, but I just I try to please myself and make time for everybody. And I think that's what what creates that bond and, and that just kind of aura around the person to say, hey, this is a good person. We need to put her more in the spotlight. Mm. Yeah, Mike, uh, I'll break it down. If you, you should ask me that question. I'll, I'll tell you what the PBA players should be doing to better market themselves. They need to be aggressive. They need to just market themselves. Mike Fagan was a good one who used to do that. Mm -hmm. Call call out themselves. Call companies themselves. Sean Rash does a good job of that. Like, get out there like – you know, I think some of the pros, they just wait around for the PBA to do things for them when they should be out doing things for themselves. Anyway, um, one of my favorite uh, outside, I guess, exposures that you've done, Kelly, is the uh, ESPN, the body uh, issue, right? And to me, that was national, right? Like, I mean, it was... Worldwide, really, I mean. Worldwide, right? And, you know, right. I'm big into fitness. Um, so I guess I just want to talk to you about that experience. What was that like putting yourself out there like that? You just said you were a pretty private person and now you're posting pretty much nude on ESPN so everybody could see it. And I guess, so that's my first question, two part question, right? Like one, like what was that experience like Two, what did you do? Like how long did you have to prepare for that catalog? And could you give me any fitness tips? Because if ESPN calls me up, I, I want to be like looking like that, like, you know, when 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 they come knocking on my door one day. Yeah, you know, I, I think I had about just under three months to prepare. So for about six weeks, I was really disciplined with the food and I was exercising. And then the last two weeks, I lagged off a little bit. Um, I, I was in good shape for that magazine. I would have liked to have been in, in a touch more. I think I'm in better shape now than I was back then. So, but to, to be asked, you know... There, you, you have to do some things for free. You have to do some things that, that sacrifice your own time in order to open up these other doors. And it, and, and it did. It just gave me another notoriety, gave me uh, to be noticed in the, in the world of ESPN, in the magazine. And it's grown even more of some of the great athletes that got to grace the cover and the pages inside. So I did it. It was gonna, It was classy. It was tasteful. You know, I think there might have been four or five people in the whole studio themselves. And by the end of the day, you just got comfortable. It took about five hours. You got comfortable. It's like, yeah, it's just you get comfortable in your own skin after a while. And and at my only regret, I do have a regret there. I had a 15 pound bowling ball and I had to get in that balance position so many times. My legs were sore for the next two to three days. So had I known differently, I would have drilled like a 10 or 12 pound bowling ball. But it, yeah, you, just, you have to make those sacrifices. And I think um, I think that's what's missing in some of the younger younger bowlers is that they're just not willing to give up their time or make the sacrifice in order to, to give themselves an opportunity to go through other, other doors along the way. Mike, if, if that was me and I was on ESPN and they were, they were shooting me five hours naked, I'd be so, I'd be wearing a towel around my neck. I would, I would just be walking around butt nude, like, just like, Hey, this is what you guys got. Like take it in kind of like that scene of Anchorman, you know, like he's just like, um, anyway, Kelly, that was, uh, an, you know, love that. Um, and, uh, three months, you know, that's, that's not a whole lot of prepare for. If I knew I was going on ESPN, Mike would need like two ESPN, years. ESPN, hit me up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mike would need, Mike would need, there would have to be a whole nother body episode to be like a football player. Body. I need that like, two page spread. I need yeah, a two need like page a, spread. You feel me? Okay. Yeah. 
Hook me up. Um, Hit me up. Okay. If you're doing a podcast <laughs> podcast uh, episode, maybe. Uh, so Kelly, we're gonna we're gonna start to get you out of here. We've taken up a, a lot of your time, but you you uh, what's what's on deck for you? You know, you you kind of alluded uh, earlier that you know maybe you're not really feeling bowling so much right now. So, do you have plans to bowl? Are you taking a break from the game? What uh what's what what do you got going on? Well, you know, the pandemic kind of put the whole. Uh, pen in the spoke there for me. So yeah, I was going to slow down. I was just going to basically bowl the majors this year and a few other, a few other events just to loyalty like Rockford and so forth. Um, and my perspective on bowling just changed a little bit. You know, I think the ladies tour being back is a great opportunity to, to grow and expand, you know, I, but I still want to see it get better. I still want to see more sponsors come in. I want larger prize funds. I want the payout to go even further down the field and make that payout even larger. So I, 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 it's like I'm still fighting to, to grow it even more. And after 20 something years, I, I'm just a little tired of putting on the gloves and getting in the rink and getting my head beat in. So I took a break this year. In, and now at the, the PBA Draft League is great. The women are going to bowl. There's those two teams of five women that are going to bowl. Next year, I'm just, I'm in the gym a lot. I really enjoy fitness these days. I really like helping people learn in the gym. Uh, my social part is line dancing. I'm doing a dance workshop on Tuesday. I like helping people. I wish I could make a living doing that, uh, not just in bowling, but in all aspects and make a great living at it. I really I, I enjoy getting pleasure out of people doing well in what they love to do. So when the tour comes back next year, um, we were told that it was a copy and paste tour. So there, hopefully there'll be the same amount of events as next year. I'm not sure though with the pandemic that might again, throw a wrench into the spoke and see what happens, but you will still see me competing. I don't think the, the drive, I, I think I still love bowling. I just really did not enjoy it last year. And, and it's all about accountability guys. I admit my attitude was piss poor last year. I really wasn't enjoying the format. I mean, we were getting there at eight o'clock in the morning and we weren't leaving there till 1030 at night to be back for an 8.15 aim roll call and, and draw out a ball and, and put, it was it was not fun and I just did not enjoy it at all. So my goal was to take a break. I've got it this year. I don't know with after this pandemic if I will be bowling full time, but you will see me on the lanes. That is a guarantee for sure. Storm is great. They, they sent three new bowling balls to my doorstep just last week. I'm looking forward to to putting holes in those, no weight hole anymore and, and throwing those. So I still love how they smell. Barb and Bill Chrisman, you know, what they do for the family of bowling itself and all our staff members and everybody out there, it's fantastic. So you're still going to see me be competitive. I'm just not sure how much. Um, I, I little slighted that the draft I didn't get picked, but, you know, like I said, accountability. My year was not great last year. The, the, the women that bowled, the only thing I could say is I came off, you know, winning team trials back-to-back -back years and having such a great performance that I felt I could have brought some experience to the teams and everything had being, you know, part of that when it first started. But, um, you know, there's that there's that little desire right there from uh, being able to want to pick up a ball and bowl again. So we'll see what happens. Like I said, don't count Kelly out, but um, we're just not sure never. how much. Yeah. My, never that. Let's, are you, are you kidding? I mean, Rob, Rob. Mm. This is sweep mm, the rack. I'm right here. This is sweep the rack, Rob. Yep. This is sweep the rack. We keep it 100 around here. Tell them, Rob. Tell the people. Oh, Tell the people um, our thoughts, Rob. I'm going to go out on the record here. You not getting picked was complete and utter bullshit. I literally bullshit. went down the list. Bullshit. It and was I will talk bullshit. It's one I, of the greatest I, female players ever. Mike, Mike I, will, I would bring on the managers and put them out I'm here sorry, right now on my face. screen. Bring them on here right now. Tell them right now. Bullshit. What do you? I, first thing I would be saying is, what are you smoking? Are you guys on drugs? What were you doing that Crazy. morning? Like, I, I, that's all I'm really gonna say on that, Kelly. It's disrespectful. Dude, the resume it's here, it the is the team resume, right? The team resume, not including the 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 team USA, the college bowling, the experience. The, oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Has she won uh, against men, Rob? Has she won against men? Dude, oh, look, check, check. Look. Okay. You know, Rob, but just like you pointed out, you know, had I, I, I torn off old, I may not hold the TSC. You know, maybe I didn't get picked this year, but maybe I get picked next year and, and we win the whole thing. And I and I walk away with a bigger, you know, wad of cash in my pocket than I would have been this year. So, oh, if I'm, I'm if I'm a manager, I, I, I honestly he like be. he won't be. I, I can won't guarantee be. he won't. Kelly, you'd have been the number one pick, Kelly. I'll be well, honest I gotta with you. Say too, you know, again, I don't feel so bad because there's not going to be fans in the audience. And by right. watching that show on TV and what those fans bring to that telecast, I'm kind of glad I'm not missing. I'm, I'm missing out on it this year because I hope to be back the following year 
watching all those women and men and young kids just cheer on having that crowd going and, and get to be in an atmosphere like that. So I know the women are going to represent themselves and, and the PWA and bowling very, very well. So maybe next year is going to be the year so we can experience it with the fans. And that's when, when I'll really get to live it and enjoy it. Yep, Kelly well, just inadvertently agreed with me that the shows this weekend were a snooze fest, but she didn't really say that. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's kind of how I don't took do it. Don't do that. So listen, she's not going to come back on if you do that. So don't do that. She won't oh, come Rob's back a good on. Good friend, again. and you guys out there, he didn't. I don't know if he told everybody out there, but he was my date to the ESPYS the year I got nominated to go. So you know, on oh. a last minute rival, I called Rob and, and Bill O'Neill. Him, of course, were good friends and still are. But uh, Rob was my, my my handheld date that night at the ESPYs. And Rob, didn't we have Yo, a good time? We walked the red carpet, girl. Don't think I don't remember that. Yep. We <laughs> yeah. we were killing it on the red carpet. And I was like on a last minute. Like I, I, I put together this suit that I had. Like it was like. Well, Rob, years. clearly we know if someone brought you to an event somewhere, it was last minute. We clearly understand. Everyone assumes that if you I took went it with too. somebody, it, you were a fill-in oh. last minute. Oh, my God. Who can I bring? We all get dude, that. I, you didn't dude, even say that. I, I, I went with it, too. I, oh, it was the greatest the greatest two days. I swear. I, I still – that was like the, the peak of my life, Kelly, That those two days. <laughs> Everything else has just been going like this since the ESPYs. You well, you can thank Bill for that because, like, I got this friend, Rob. I see, I know Rob. I know Rob. We know each other. How are all this? I know. We get, I know. Come on. Don't make see, Bill was working out. And Bill's Mike still hasn't out. went yet. Mike still hasn't went to the ESPYs yet, and it That's annoys right. him. That's it okay. bothers him. It bothers That's okay. him till no, the day. It's all right. It's on the West Coast. It's fine. If it was on the East Coast, at some point, I'd be a little, I'd be a little bit heated. But oh, yeah. we were you talking know, to celebrities. Okay. Oh, we were talking to celebrities. Uh, Kelly was talking to that one figure skater. I remember um, uh, Apollo Ono. Apollo oh, Ono was in the magazine too. I just I watched yeah. him walk by. I know. I, just Dude, his belief, you know. I remember Bill's reaction when Dr. J walked by us. He was like yeah. a Philly legend. Bill was like, I've never been starstruck. He couldn't even talk. He was stuttering and stuff. I was like, what a, this is amazing. I could talk so about the take, ESPYs. You take me to the ESPYs, I'm going to be like, oh, my God, it's Sean Rash. You see Sean <laughs> Rash? It's Sean Rash over there. Oh, my you're God. You're such a you fanboy. Jason you're Belmonte's such a, over here. You're such yeah, a PBA fanboy. We're going to – oh, my God. I know. Kelly, listen, we appreciate the time. Uh, it was fun to have you on. We'll, we'll you, Anytime you want. You got an open invitation on Sweet hey, the Rap. Rob's got my number. He can text me anytime, so I'd be happy to. You know, I, I got a lot of free time lately, so next yeah, time you want to talk some, some physical fitness, Rob, you know, we can get into that. We can get into some other stuff too. Dude, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'll you know, talk again, physical fitness all day. Thank you for the time. You mentioned Storm. Obviously, you've been with them for a while. Uh, any What other companies are supporting you out there as you're doing your thing? Um, you know, I just signed with Logo Infusion this year, so Ken and Kathy Keegan, but I, I, I got to say Hi Five was there for so many years too, so thank you to them. Bowler X, Lee Zant and his wife, Christy, what a great couple they are with their pro shops on the East Coast and, and the support they've given to both the men and women's tour. And then I, I got to give a right hand thank you um, to, to Cecil Scarborough and Vice Inserts. Cecil is one of my best friends on tour. He takes care of all the women, all the men, and he is, you know, talk about a classy human being, an individual. If you want an honest answer or you need help, he would give the shirt off his back to, to somebody if they needed it. So all my sponsors out there, and then, of course, you know, USBC, BPAA, and, and PWA for, for bringing the ladies back and having us. And, and you guys, you guys, I was on with Justin Bone last weekend. We've had some storm podcasts and stuff on Facebook. You know, if it wasn't for you gentlemen and bringing this exposure for, for everybody out there, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do this and have fun enjoying talking to you and the fans. So thank you for everything you've brought to bowling and continue to do for our sport. No doubt. Kelly, appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm adding to your resume a uh, guest on Sweep the Rock. So <laughs> it just went to page five. So Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Kelly, thank Kelly, you very we much. Appreciate we appreciate it. it. All thank right, guys, so I'm going to sign off. I look forward to being back in the future, all right? Oh, you're coming. Oh, all right. All right. Bye, Kelly. Take care, guys. So, Rob, uh, you know, first time we did a live interview, uh, I, you know, I feel like it went pretty well, you know, very similar to uh, our old format, you know? Yeah. Uh, what a class act she is. I mean, I've known her since I was a kid uh, and she's always been such a just an awesome person. I mean, you, you see what you get with her. She's trying to be ambassador for the sport and try to be ambassador for the women's sport. And it's amazing, like how like 
like my brother said it in in, in in the chat like she convinced she helped my brother get into Saginaw which eventually re reason why I went to Saginaw so I mean she had a lot of you know what I was gonna say a little you know, influence on my life too you know and the ESPYs was really cool too I could talk about that for for for, for months but um you know I she's talking about her being burnt out I I, I feel like Eight, I mean, the women's people who are running the women's tour after hearing that they need to like kind of re look at their schedules, Mike, 8 a.m. at 1030 and then have to be back. I mean, who wants to be in a bowling alley? I mean, even like, like if it's your job and you're working, nobody wants to work from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., you know, weekly, uh, daily. Like it's just a bad schedule. Like they need to re look at that. So women like Kelly don't get, um, uh, you know, re uh, like burnt out. Right. So. Anyway, Mike, great interview. Yeah, really. You know, one one thing I thought uh, as she spoke there about some of Yo, the Yo, Mom Duke's in the chat too. And, Mom Duke's uh, in the chat. What up, Mom? <laughs> he said he said hello at the beginning. He said hello I at did. the beginning. I he, did. So he got you covered. I did. Um, she, you know, she spoke a lot about what, you know liking to help people and physical fitness and some of the classes that she teaches that are outside of bowling and. Rob, you know what came to mind for me? I probably should have said this while she was still on here, but you could shoot her a text like, college is out there. Are you listening? Is there a college bowling program that needs a, a coach out there, a serious college bowling program? I mean, sounds like that that would be, uh, you know, like a, a perfect fit for some of the things that she talked about there, Rob. Yeah, and especially with the NCAA, uh, I know that the, the – the coaches and the, and the players are, are pretty good uh, compensated, I guess. I mean, it's not like retirement money, but definitely the NCAA puts in a lot of money into the women's uh, the women's half of uh, the college bowling. Yeah. Um, I always wonder why the men never got an NCAA. That's a whole nother podcast, Mike. No, nah, um, you know, it has to do with the bowling for money. You know? Yeah, which, yeah. I mean, guys, are gonna, we're going to bowl for money anyway. Um, right. So you might as well sanction NCAA and just let them fish it out. But, uh, right. yeah, I mean, she's had, like, I mean, yeah, she put more head state on the map. And safe to say, like, she was a really major part of women's bowling back, you know, uh, until and, and today, right? Like, yeah. and her not being drafted is also a tragedy, Mike, and not something that hopefully I would love to see her on a team and them win. And then, you know, that would be awesome. Like, just a kind of a, a nephew to the people who didn't draft it this year. True. But, uh, all right, Rob, uh, I, that, that will call it wraps. Uh, we'll, we'll be live Wednesday. To, Wednesday. Uh, we got a lot to, to talk, talk about. about. Talk about the, the shows from this past weekend. You know, save oh, your comments. Sorry. I just – Save uh, your uh, comments. We'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, Wednesday. So, people join us. We appreciate everybody popping in and uh, chatting with us tonight. Joe Scarlato writing a novel in the chat. Come on, Joe. Come come on the show, dog. Come have a conversation with us. We're always open to having the people on. This is a podcast of the people. So, uh, we appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, Rob, we out? We out, man. Everyone have a good week. And, yeah, we'll see you guys Wednesday night. You are now listening to Sweep the Rack podcast featuring Brooklyn Rob.